Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's Russ Barkley back again on a lovely Saturday morning here in Richmond. Thank you, thank you. I know you've been waiting all week for this. I have. We're going to start with some dad jokes, as always. Uh, these are so-so, but uh, I haven't used them before. And trust me, I'm starting to run out of websites and dad jokes now after two years of doing this every week. But let's have a look at the ones that I found. Here we go. If prisoners could take their own mug shots, they'd be called selfies. So-so. <laughs> uh, Have you heard about the new corduroy pillows? They're making headlines. That, that's pretty bad. That's pretty, you want one even worse than that? Here it is. If a pig loses its voice, does it become disgruntled? And finally, just to make your morning what, much worse than it was before you started this video, want to hear a joke about paper? Never mind. It's terrible. Yeah, we need a laugh track because those really aren't all that funny. Those come to us by way of the website Men's Health. My thanks to them for loading them to me. Maybe. Okay, we have four studies to talk about this week. One of them is a review of acupuncture in the management of ADHD in children and teens. And specifically, it's looking not only at the effectiveness of acupuncture, but in comparison to methylphenidate. And this appeared over in the journal Complementary Therapies and Medicine, and obviously it was done by a research team primarily in China, though there were some located elsewhere as well. The review finds 25 studies in the literature that used more than 1,700 participants to examine the effects of acupuncture. Now, they did find that acupuncture did improve some of the symptoms of ADHD. Specifically, it was better at improving impulsive and hyperactive symptoms, even in comparison to methylphenidate. They also found that when you combined acupuncture with methylphenidate, it reduced some of the side effects related to methylphenidate, such as appetite problems, sleeping difficulties, dry mouth, abdominal pain, and so on. They also found that acupuncture combined with behavior therapy was better than behavior therapy alone, mainly in improving psychosomatic symptoms. But here's the problem with all of this. None of these studies are controlled studies. There was no randomized controlled procedure or comparisons of acupuncture to a placebo group. And we need that because, as you know, just giving attention to people, particularly sticking needles in them, might result in people reporting more improvements in themselves, or in this case, parents reporting improvements in their children, than would be the case if you had no treatment at all. But that doesn't mean that it's the treatment that's producing the effects. It could just be the attention and the procedure itself, and not so much the therapeutic aspect of the procedure that is causing people to report an improvement in symptoms. So when there's no placebo, when there's no blinding of raters, such that they don't know what procedure the child got or didn't get, then it's very difficult to reach conclusions about a treatment. So in this case, while acupuncture might be useful in helping treat ADHD in children, we can't draw any conclusions about that as yet because the studies necessary to reach those conclusions, randomized controlled trials with placebos, were not done yet. So maybe investigators will step up and do a better job in the future of exploring the utility and effectiveness of this treatment. All right, my next study comes to us from the journal MedRxIV, and it is a huge study that involved the large databases from several different countries, including the Swedish Twin Registry, also the Estonian Biobank, and the Norwegian Mother, Father, and Child Cohort Study. You combine them all together, we are talking about nearly 400,000 people were involved in this study. And what is it about? They are looking at computing 
the risk genes for several psychiatric disorders, including ADHD. So they're going to add up all the risk genes that they found in people when they did genome-wide DNA scans on them. And they're going to look at the relationship of those risk scores. How many genes do you have? So, to put it simply, it's actually more complicated than that. So how many risk genes do you have? And is that related to cardio or metabolic disease? Now, of course, by metabolic disease, they're talking about things like high cholesterol, hyperlipidemia. They're talking about type 2 diabetes and so on, obesity. Uh, and in terms of cardiovascular disease, of course, they're looking at hypertension, atherosclerosis, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, and so on, uh, as well as cerebral vascular disease. So what did the study find? It found that the higher the number of risk genes you had for ADHD, the greater was your risk of having one of those metabolic disorders. We already know that ADHD is linked to an increased risk for type 2 diabetes, so it's not surprising that they found this, but they found it was risk for other metabolic disorders as well. On the other hand, they found that the number of risk genes for major depressive disorder was related to <clears throat> the risk for cardiovascular problems. So, two different psychiatric disorders altering the risk for metabolic versus cardiovascular disorders, ADHD specifically, being linked to risk for metabolic disorders. So a very interesting large-scale study there showing that genes for ADHD aren't just for ADHD. They may well be related to or associated with an increased risk for a variety of other problems, including medical problems. All right, my next study, it's a relatively small study, but it was published over in Brain Imaging and Behavior, and I'm going to concentrate on it mainly because it's kind of an upward extension of large studies that were done uh, back in the 2000s. So this would be about maybe 15 years or so ago. And those studies followed children over time, rescanned their brains with MRI every couple of years, and they had ADHD kids and control children, and they reported that there was reduced gray matter, so thinner gray matter, in the brains of ADHD children, and that these brains developed at a slower pace. That is, maturation was about two to three years behind that of other of control children. Well, this study that I'm talking about this morning, which was just published last week, is looking at the cortical morphology, that is the thickness of the brains of young adults with ADHD compared to control adults. Uh, and they are also going to take a look at the sizes of the gyri, th those are the ridges in the brain, and the sulci, those are the valleys between those ridges in the brain. And what did they find? They found that the ADHD group exhibited significant cortical thinning in the fronto, parietal, and temporal regions. This is what was found in those longitudinal studies of children. This study extends those findings up to young adults, suggesting that they too have problems with the gray matter cortical development on the surface of the head. They also found some differences in the size of the gyri and the sulci in the group with ADHD. So they point out that their data suggests that ADHD-related disparities in brain morphology do persist into young adulthood. And that's why I wanted to talk about that study. It extends the results of earlier studies. My next study up uh, is, I think, a very important one. It's a review of the literature, not really a study, and it's on the effects of psychostimulants on menstruating women with ADHD. Now, you know I have several earlier videos on this topic of ADHD symptoms and their relationship <clears throat> to sex hormones in women, particularly throughout their menstrual cycle and throughout their life cycle. 
in terms of changes in the relative proportion of estrogen and progesterone. But very few studies have looked at the effectiveness of stimulants during the phase of the menstrual cycle. This review identified two studies that did just that. They're not large-scale studies, but what they found is that during the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle, which is the first day of menstruation, and it continues up to ovulation. So during that phase of the cycle, which is when there's a lot of estrogen available to women, what happens is the stimulants appear to be effective, such as amphetamines, and they are equally as effective as they are in men with ADHD taking comparable doses. However, the studies, both of them found, that during the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, which occurs after ovulation, which is when there is more progesterone being released, that women found that their response to amphetamine was not as effective as it has been in the earlier phase of their cycle or as it is relative to men taking amphetamines. So both of these studies prove what we've been hearing from women with ADHD for quite some time. And that is that not only are their symptoms fluctuating much more than we see in men, particularly throughout these changes in their hormonal cycles, but also that their medication seems to change in its effectiveness during their phases of their monthly cycle. And both of these studies confirm that. So while we do need a lot more research on this issue, I did want to call to your attention that there now seem to be at least two such studies out there. This particular review was published just yesterday in the journal Progress in Neuropsychopharmacology and Biological Psychiatry. Okay, everybody, I hope that you found these research reviews to be useful to you. Uh, I certainly always enjoy reading about them, keeps me up to date as well. Even though I'm retired, I still enjoy reading about the latest advances in our understanding of ADHD and its management. And I hope that bringing these to you makes you better informed about ADHD. So thanks for joining me this Saturday. As always, live well, take care, be well, and bye for now.